Okay, so a little bit of a review. I want to put the, the um, what Esther has been doing the last few lectures into a little bit broader context, and that's going to be a sort of a nice segue into talking about linear regression. So what did we do for the first sort of half of the semester? We established a foundation in probability, and we proceeded uh, to talk about how to estimate um, unknown parameters. Okay, um, Most, if not all, of that discussion was focused on estimating parameters of a univariate distribution. Okay, So we, we were talking about estimating the mean or estimating the variance or something like that, some other parameter that characterizes uh, you know, sort of a um, univariate distribution. But so much of what we care about in social science and in lots of other settings, I mean, maybe sort of most other settings, involves joint distributions, though. And so we really have to be concerned with how to estimate parameters characterizing either joint distributions or conditional distributions or something like that. Okay? So Esther's discussion of causality was really the beginning of this. And it was also, we could think of it as a special case, okay? So um, you can think of much of what she did as considering the joint distribution uh, of two variables where one was simply a coin flip. Um, so if you, f you flip the coin and it comes up heads, that's a treatment. That uh, observation has a treatment. And if it comes up tails, that observation is assigned to control, okay? And then the other random variable that was defined on this uh, sample uh, was the outcome of interest, say infant mortality or website effectiveness or something like that. Okay, So we didn't always uh, talk about, oh, and I should say, in fact, we were mostly concerned with the conditional distribution of the outcome variable conditional on this coin flip. Okay. So we can and we did think of the treatment and the control groups sometimes as being sort of two separate populations. And so then we asked the question, well, how could we test whether uh, they had a common mean? Okay. But we can also think of them as having one population and a joint distribution of two random variables on that population. Okay. And what we're really what we were really doing is estimating conditional means a conditional on this coin flip uh, random variable, okay? So these are, these are sort of two different ways to think about like randomized control trials and, and uh, the, the things that Esther was talking about the couple, uh, last a couple of lectures, okay? And they're, they're sort of equivalent uh, ways to think about them. Okay, now I want to pose a question. What if instead of a coin flip, the second random variable is continuous instead, okay? So let's suppose we have a random variable. It can take on a whole range of values. We can still think of it as being sort of levels of treatment or something like that. We don't necessarily have to think of it that way, but you can think of it that way. Uh, but instead of just being a coin flip, treatment control, um, it can uh, you know, take on uh, um, many different values. Okay? How do we analyze the conditional distribution of our outcome variable conditional on something like a continuous random variable? And furthermore, how do we estimate the parameters of that conditional distribution? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, the workhorse model we use is called the linear model. And the way that we estimate the parameters in a linear model is linear regression, or that's typically the way that we estimate them. So why do we care about joint distributions and estimating the parameters associated with them? Well, we've seen a bunch of examples, but let me just sort of throw out a couple more. Um, so the, the, we might be interested in prediction. We might be interested in determining causality. And we might just be interested in understanding the world better. So let me give you sort of examples of each of these. OK, so let's suppose uh, I, let's, let's imagine that uh, I'm the type of person who reads XKCD comics. And I'm also the type of person who is likely to click on an ad for a t-shirt bearing the Russian cover design of Moby Dick. Okay? So who might be interested in whether that statement is true? Amazon or whoever's selling the t-shirts with the sort of cover of uh, the Russian Moby Dick on them. Right? Okay, so anyone, basically anyone who wants to sell me that 
product or anyone who wants to serve me an ad that might get me to click on the ad and buy the product cares about whether the, per, the kind of person who reads X case, KCD comics is also the kind of person who buys such t-shirts. It turns out I am such a person. I do both of those things. And I thought, I'll just show you my favorite XKCD comic um, and let you read it for a second. And I did just order this t-shirt um, from Out of Print, uh, which I think is a pretty nice looking t-shirt. That's for all you course six majors, I guess. <laughs> Okay, can I go ahead? Okay, so, so anyhow, it, th this is, there's nothing about causality in this example, right? I mean, it's not, I didn't read the XKCD comic and think, oh, now I have to go buy this sort of t-shirt. It's just that I'm the kind of person who might do both of those things. So someone wanting to sell me that t-shirt would like to know that so they can serve me the ad when I'm reading XKCD, okay? Um, we might want to determine causality. Esther talked about a number of examples um, in this vein. So let's suppose I, I want to know the, the answer to the following question. If I give my dog a treat every time he does not bark at another dog walking by our house, will he stop barking at other dogs? So that's the kind of, you know, sort of a causal question I might want to answer to, right? The answer, by the way, is no. Um, and the only reason I brought up this example is so I would have an excuse to show you my sweet little dog. Okay. But I have not carried out such a statistical, um, uh, such a statistical analysis. I'm pretty sure the answer is no, though. Okay. And then maybe we just care about joint distributions um, because we want to understand the world better. So, if we were behavioral economists, we might be interested in the following question. Are people, when, are people only influenced by price, quality, characteristics, and the uh, expected weather that they have in the area of the country where they live um, when they're deciding whether to purchase a convertible? Or are they also influenced by the weather on that particular day? Okay. So behavioral economists might be interested in a question like this because um, they want to understand, you know, sort of what influences sort of economic decisions that agents make. Do they make sort of rational decisions or, you know, are they deciding to buy a, a convertible because they know what the weather is going to be like over the next five years and that's sort of the, the period of time they're going to own the car? Or are they likely to make these sort of uh, decisions that are hard to justify by any sort of rational economic model like, gosh, it's really sunny today, maybe I'll buy a convertible that I'm going to now have for the next five years. Well, uh, turns out that they are, and this was a recent paper in the QJE, the Psych Psychological Effect of Weather and Car Purchases, uh, that uh, fairly um, uh, convincing, convincingly established that people are, in fact, influenced by the weather on the day that they make a purchase. Uh, when, it's, uh, when the weather's bad, snowy, uh, they're more likely to um, make a purchase of an SUV. And this is controlling for, uh, you know, sort of the expected weather, uh, you know, sort of going forward. And likewise, if it's sunny, they're more likely to buy a convertible controlling for the expected weather. So anyhow, I, I actually, I, I went to a talk. I saw this paper a few years ago. I was convinced by the results, but I also sort of chuckled. I thought, oh, that's so ridiculous. Why, how could someone be so influenced? Well, turns out that last summer, um, I decided I was going to buy this car. <laughs> and the car, so I was waiting for the 2016 model to come out. And it was a really hot model of car. I couldn't even uh, test drive it. I mean, it was like really hard to sort of, and I thought, okay, I thought about the QGE paper and I said, all I have to do is wait until the weather gets bad and then the, the you know, models of this car will sort of build up on the dealer's lots and I'll just waltz in and be able to buy one and maybe I'll even get a deal on it, right? Well, turns out as soon as the weather got bad, I kind of lost my interest <laughs> in buying the convertible and I just ended up buying a sedan, so. Okay, 
So in each of these examples, we had two or more random variables that had a joint distribution. And we wanted to know the characteristics of their joint distribution in order to answer the questions that we were interested in. OK, so how do we do this? Well, I told you already the workhorse model to do this is the linear model. So let me introduce the linear model by variate style. We'll sort of generalize that later. Um, and let me just sort of go through and define what the things in this linear model are. OK, and then we'll talk about uh, sort of properties of it. And we'll talk about how to estimate the parameters in it and, and so forth. OK, well, the linear model is a model that sort of establishes a relationship between two random variables on which we have repeated observations. So these are uh, y and x. So y is what we call the dependent variable. Okay? Sometimes you will re hear that referred to as the explained variable or the regressand. I would say hardly ever do I hear those terms, but those are both you know, sort of legitimate terms, I guess, for the dependent variable. And then the x variable is typically called the regressor or explanatory variable, or sometimes called the in independent variable. So even though like regressor and regressand seem to go together, or independent variable and dependent variable seem to go together, that, that's not the way these terms are used. Typically, we refer to the, uh, the y variable as the dependent variable. And typically, you'll refer to the x variable as either the regressor or the explanatory variable. Okay, And there, there are some reasons for that. But this is just basically what people do, just so you're uh, familiar with the terms. And then we have a third random variable thrown into the mix, an unobserved random variable. And we call that the error. We also have two parameters in this model, or at least two obvious parameters. We have another one that we'll talk about later. Uh, and these are uh, parameters we want to estimate. And we call these the regression coefficients. OK, so what does this model do? It allows us to consider the mean of a random variable y as a function of another random variable x. And if we obtain estimates for beta naught and beta 1, then we have an estimated conditional mean function for y. So let's add some basic assumptions, and then we will get to something called the classical linear regression model when we sort of pile on a few more assumptions. OK, first of all, let's assume that our two uh, random variables on the right side are uncorrelated. OK, so x sub i and epsilon sub i are uh, uncorrelated random variables. Um, let's assume uh, that this, what this uh, second assumption called identification means is just basically that we have some variation in our x variable. I'm going to show you a picture uh, illustrating this in a second. But basically, that just means that um, the x variable is not, uh, the, re the sort of um, repeated observations on the x variable are not all on the same uh, point. Okay? We're going to assume that uh, the expectation of our error is equal to 0. We'll assume a homoscedasticity, which means that the expectation of our error squared is equal to sigma squared for all i. And we're going to also assume uh, that we do not have serial correlation. So in particular, the expectation of epsilon i, epsilon j is equal to 0 for all i and j. Okay? So let me talk about each one of these in turn and uh, show you some pictures so you sort of understand exactly what the meat of these assumptions is. OK. Oh, I should, a uh, couple notes. We sometimes impose an alternate assumption to 1 uh, for our convenience. And that's sometimes we assume that instead of x being a random variable, xi being a random variable, um, we assume that xi's are fixed in repeated samples or non-stochastic. This makes some of the proofs easier. Sometimes we do it for convenience. It, the, the results essentially go through uh, without that assumption. But we'll sort of go back and forth between that. 
And then the other note is that assumptions, I, we had the three different assumptions on the error term, and all of those assumptions could be subsumed under one stronger assumption, that the epsilons are IID uh, normal zero sigma squared, okay? So sometimes, especially when we talk about inference, we'll uh, impose that assumption. Uh, again, that assumption is not necessary for almost anything that we do in linear regression, but uh, sometimes it's sort of convenient. It makes the proofs easy, easier and uh, sort of more elegant, I guess. Okay, so let's look at uh, this assumption number two called identification. So um, I have this kind of uh, strange looking um, equation up at the top, but all that means is that we're ruling out a case where all of our observations on x are on a particular value x naught, okay? And the reason we rule out this case is because this doesn't give us any variation in x that we need to identify the mean of y as a function of x, okay? If we're trying to fit a, a, a you know, sort of a regression line, we just have a bunch of um, observations on a particular point and we can't do it, okay? Uh, the, the third um, assumption is that the error has a zero mean. Well, so basically what we rule out, so here I've drawn a picture of an error having a positive mean, okay? And we just rule this out because we don't have any information that would help us separately, you know, sort out whether our error just had a, a, a zero mean and the, uh, the regression line was shifted up, or rather the zero, uh, whether the error had a positive mean and our regression line was shifted down, okay? We can't, we don't have any information to sort of separately to sort those two possibilities out, so we just assume that the error has zero variant, or uh, zero <coughs> expectation, okay? And I should say, uh, uh, well, another, Another way to say this is that those two, the, the, the expectation of the error and the intercept of the regression line are not separately identified. That's another sort of piece of terminology. That just means we don't have any way to, to you know, sort them out with the data. Okay, our fourth assumption is homoscedasticity. So what is homoscedasticity? It just means that we're going to assume that the variance for all of our errors, the, the variance is, is uh, equal to sigma squared, okay, for all, oh, that's supposed to be all little i, but my autocorrect made it capital I, I think, okay? Um, so this is a picture of what the opposite of homoscedasticity might look like. This is called heteroscedasticity. And here I've drawn it so that it looks like the error variance for low values of x is much higher than the error variance for higher values of x, okay? And so we're, we're going to rule that out for now. That's actually not a fatal problem. We can deal with it, but at least for now, we're going to assume that we have homoscedasticity and not heteroscedasticity. So right about now, you're probably thinking, what is the etymology of homo and heteroscedasticity, and is she even spelling it right? Um, because, in fact, my autocorrect kept trying to replace K with C whenever I was typing homoscedasticity. Turns out that the autocorrect in PowerPoint has not read this article in Econometrica on the etymology and the correct spelling of <laughs> homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity. So anyhow, you can, I've put this up on the website. You can peruse this uh, at your leisure. But uh, this will answer all your questions about the origin of these words. Okay, and then the fifth um, assumption is that we have no serial correlation. So that means, in other words, that the, um, the, er the sort of errors are not correlated uh, if they're coming from different, if they're associated with different observations, okay? So a stronger way of saying this is that the errors are independent across observations. We don't, we don't need to impose that. We're just going to say that they're uncorrelated, okay? Um, here's a picture. I drew a picture of positive, what positive serial correlation might look, look like. So here we have 
Um, you know, here we have sort of some positive errors over on the left side. And then if you have one positive error, the, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, close by errors are also likely to be positive. And so you have sort of an area where errors are mostly positive. And then you get sort of a negative error. And then, you know, sort of most of the errors close by are likely to be negative. So that's what, this is what positive serial correlation might look like. The, the errors are kind of clumped spatially like this. Okay? Again, this is not fatal. We can deal with this, but we're going to assume for now that we don't have it. Okay, and then as I said, assumptions three through five could be subsumed under a stronger assumption that epsilon i or iid normal zero sigma squared. Okay? So we don't typically need this assumption, sometimes we impose it. And that just means that, you know, conditional, yeah, basically. There, the error just has a, a little normal distribution that looks like that. Okay, so what are the things that we can say about this model, first of all? What are some, some of the properties? Well, we can, uh, we can calculate what the expectation of y is. And I should say we can, we can think of this. So right now, during this calculation, I'm making the assumption, just for my convenience, that the x's are non-stochastic. And so I haven't said that the expectation of y is conditional on x. But we can think of this as basically the, the conditional distribution of y given x. And so basically, if I'm assuming uh, that the x's are non-stochastic, it makes my life a little bit easier because I take the expectation of beta naught plus beta 1 uh, x sub i plus epsilon sub i. And the x's are non-stochastic, so they just come, they're just uh, constants. They come outside the expectation. And it just sort of makes the calculations easy, OK? And so we get, in particular, that the expectation of y sub i is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x sub i, OK? Uh, we can do a similar calculation with variance of y sub i. And we get that that is just equal to uh, sigma squared. So it's the same variance as the error. And then we can also do a, calcula a similar calculation uh, showing that uh, for any i and j, where i is not equal to j, the covariance between y sub i and y sub j is equal to 0. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and so I just want to emphasize the betas then are parameters in the conditional mean function. OK, so we've got this linear function. We've got sort of a set of assumptions that we're willing to impose for now. So our next question is, how do we find estimates for beta naught and beta 1? Well, here's, I'm just going to throw up three different options. And I'll very quickly dismiss two of them. But just so you know that there are sort of other things that you can consider other than least squares estimates. Um, so one thing that we could do is we could, uh, we could find the least squares estimates. In other words, the values of beta naught hat and uh, beta 1 hat such that this uh, expression here is minimized. Okay? Um, and I'll show you pictures of what these look like in a second. We could, instead of minimizing the sum of squared errors, which is what, so each one of these uh, each one of these in this parenthesis in the parenthesis is um, is is a resi well, if it, it's an error if beta naught and beta one are the true parameters, it's a residual if they're the estimates. But uh, what we do is, um, you know, we call if we plug in the estimates, we call that a residual, and then uh, if we square the residuals and sum them up and find the parameters that minimize that sum of squares, that's called a least squares estimator. We, instead of squaring them, we could just take their absolute values instead and come up with something called the least absolute deviations um, uh, uh, estimator. That's the second uh, possibility. Or we, a third possibility I'll throw out is something called the reverse least squares estimator. Okay? Let me just show you pictures of each of these in turn. So actually, the. Um, the least squares estimator and the least absolute deviations estimator have the same picture because 
what we're doing is for the least squares estimators, we're just taking this, uh, this quantity here and squaring it. And for the least absolute deviations, we're not squaring it. We're just taking the absolute value. Okay? So they have the same pictures. But what we do is uh, for the least squares estimator, we compute all of these deviations. And we choose the line that minimizes those squared deviations. Yes? So I guess at the end, how did these two differ? So I'm going to talk just a little bit. I'm going to have a slide, maybe two slides or something, about the uh, properties of least squares and why we almost always use least squares instead of least absolute deviations. Um, I'm not going to actually say too much about them, but when we get to that slide, if you have any, any other questions, let me know. OK. Um, so these are the first two possibilities. And then the picture for the third possibility just looks like this. We're minimizing the sum of squares of those deviations instead in a reverse least squares estimator. So why do we always just focus on least squares estimators? Why, do we, why is that sort of what we always do? Well, um, under the assumptions of the classical linear regression model that I had up a few minutes ago, uh, OLS, which stands for ordinary least squares, provides the minimum variance, in other words, the most efficient unbiased estimator of beta naught and beta 1. It is also the maximum likelihood estimator under normality of errors. And the estimates are consistent and asymptotically normal. Okay? And these things are not true of the other estimators. So that's why we typically always use the least, least squares estimators. Uh, are there cases when you might want to use a least absolute deviations estimator? Maybe. I mean, maybe if you're particularly worried about the credibility of your data and you think you might have some outliers that you don't want to take out of your data set, but you don't want them to have undue influence on your parameter estimates, uh, you might be able to justify using a least absolute deviations estimator. But uh, typically, people are going to go for the least squares estimators because its properties are so good. <coughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and so is the reason that uh, OLS is favorable is that like, even though they're both based on the same distance, I guess, the sensitivity in uh, the OLS is higher because it's just squared? Or yeah, it ha it, it's more sensitive to sort of observations that are kind of out in the tails because it's squared. Um, but even gi you know, given that, it still has all of these favorable properties. So you have a question? Uh, I guess not really anymore. I was sort of thinking the first, the first characteristic is a little bit circular because we define efficiency in terms of variance, and so if you had another metric for efficiency, it wouldn't necessarily be. But I guess what you're really saying is that it, it provides the minimum variance. Exactly. Yeah. So I just put in in parentheses most efficient to just remind you that that's how we, that's sort of um, how we defined, yeah, that's that's the terminology we used basically. But yeah. Yep. Properties of OLS hold if how much capacity goes out the window? Or so, uh, good question. Um, I would have to think for just a second. So, uh, basically, it that's no longer the most efficient. It's still unbiased. It's no longer the most efficient. The um, the uh, inference has to be, yeah, under under heteroscedasticity. Uh, the sort of standard inference that we'll see over the next couple of lectures has to be modified because then the, the standard errors, uh, if you use kind of the standard inference, are biased. Uh, but it's still, it's still going to have good properties, and they're, they're, we have very good ways of sort of fixing, of, of recapturing the best properties under the case of heteroscedasticity. OK. OK, so fine. Maybe, I hope I've convinced you that uh, least squares estimators uh, are the way to go and the way that we're typically going to estimate this linear model. Um, so we've got you know, sort of all of these uh, like sum of squared um, you know, sort of residuals, and we're trying to choose the, the line that's sort of uh, minimizing those. Does that mean we have to do a numerical minimization every time we want to solve for our least squares estimators? No, we don't. We have these lovely closed form solutions. Okay? So all we have to do is plug into these formulas. 
And realistically speaking, all we have to do is type, you know, like the command into R. <laughs> so, so anyhow, it, yeah, it, so there, there, if you sort of went on to do more advanced econometrics, you would in fact encounter estimators where you have to do complicated numerical minimizations every time to get parameter estimates. OLS is not one of them. We have these nice closed form solutions. Okay. How did I get these? Pages of tedious calculations that are up on the website for your viewing pleasure. So it's the, the I have a couple things to say about this. First of all, where um, the, the I can't remember what I put in under. I think I put in under derivation. There's a page of notes under, um, what's it under? Resources, maybe. And it's called derivation of OLS estimators. And so you're uh, welcome to look on those notes and see uh, the calculations that are whereby I arrived at, at the least squares estimators. The, um, the notation is slightly different. I believe in those notes, instead of having the uh, intercept um, denoted by beta naught, I think I used an alpha instead, and then a beta for the slope. Uh, and I, so I changed the, the, the notation is slightly different. But anyhow, you can look at those if you want. Um, however, I don't want you to get the idea that OLS estimators are horrible, complicated things. They're really very elegant, and they're very intuitive, but the, the thing that's holding us back is this notation, okay? So actually next time we will derive the least squares estimators using matrix notation and you will see how beautiful they are. Uh, I'm not gonna drag you through the derivation using the summation notation because it's just, it's painful. Yeah? Um, wouldn't the one over n's cancel? So sort of why do you have um, uh, do, 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 do. Oh, uh, they would. I think it's just because, oh, yeah, I think it's just because this, the, well, often time, right. So that thing on the bottom is, is like a, a sample variance. And so the, you might compute that separately and then just, yeah. Okay, and as I just said, uh, they could be lovelier still if we weren't too afraid of using matrix notation, which we're not. So we'll do it next time. Okay. Okay, a couple of important definitions. So I already told you uh, uh, just sort of verbally what a residual is. But here's a picture of residual, and you have the formula here. So a residual is basically the deviation between uh, the, an ordered pair of a particular x and y and the fitted regression line, okay? And we denote that as epsilon uh, sub i hat, typically, okay? You s sometimes we'll see other notation as well. Uh, here I've drawn in the regression line, also known as the fitted line, so that's just beta naught plus, uh, beta naught hat plus beta one hat uh, times x. And then uh, it's also convenient to define something called a fitted value. And that's basically just for any particular value of x, the value of y on the fitted line associated with that value of x, okay, on the estimated regression line. So we'll sort of come back, we'll use this notation, the y sub i hat and the epsilon sub i hat notation, uh, and we'll sort of come back to these um, quantities uh, in the next couple lectures. Okay, what do we always ask when we learn about a new estimator and why do we ask it? What do we always want to know about an estimator? Hmm? What? Well, it, it, that's a specific case. So we want to know its distribution, right? We always want to know its distribution. And not, I mean, we already, I already told you these are unbiased estimators, but uh, we want to know its distribution. And why do we want to know its distribution? Because we're not going to be able to perform inference. We're not going to be able to, to create a, um, a, a, a hypothesis test or a confidence interval if we don't know the distribution and we don't know at least the variance of uh, our estimators. Okay? So let, 
let me just uh, define a couple things. Let's uh, let x bar just equal what it typically is equal, just 1 over n times the sum of the xi's. And then let's define this thing called sigma squared hat sub x, which is 1 over n times the sum over i of xi minus x bar squared. Okay? And if we, uh, if we use that notation, then we can uh, figure out what the mean and the variance and the covariance of uh, beta hat, beta naught hat, and beta one hat are. Okay? And again, how did I get these? Pages of tedious calculations up on the website for your viewing pleasure. Um, but you can skip them if you want, because as I said, we'll see a, ni a much nicer way to, to come up with these, uh, with these formulas next time. And then how did I get the, the mean actually? I think the, the sort of calculation of the mean of these is also up on the website. But in fact, I, didn't, I already told you they were unbiased estimators. So we already knew that uh, the mean of beta hat was equal to beta hat naught was equal to beta naught. Same thing with beta 1. Okay? Okay, so let's just talk, let me take a moment to talk about a little bit of comparative statics. I think that this discussion will give you a little bit more of a feel for uh, the mechanics of a linear regression and how, um, you know, sort of how, how this thing works. So, uh, so I list them here and I'll go through each one separately. If we have a larger sigma squared, so imagine having sort of two different data sets. They're identical except for one of them has a larger error variance. What is, how is that going to affect uh, our estimates? Well, you can just look at the, the, um, the formulas for the variance and, and the covariance and so forth of, um, of beta of our estimates. And you can see that if we have a larger sigma squared, that's going to mean that the variance of beta hat is larger. Okay? I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Uh, if we have a larger uh, variance of x, so in other words, our x's are more spread out, that's going to lead to a smaller variance in beta hat. And a larger n also means a smaller variance of beta hat. And then furthermore, um, the, if, uh, if the um, mean of x is positive, then we're going to have a sort of negative covariance, a negative relationship between beta naught hat and beta 1 hat. And I didn't write it down here, but if x bar is negative, then that flips. Okay. So let me show you pictures of these, and that'll make uh, the comparative statics a little, little clearer, I think. Oh, and I should say, oh, just a point of notation. Um, I'm often going to just start sliding into sort of matrix and vector notation. And when I say beta hat, I'm talking about the vector um, beta uh, naught hat and beta one hat. Okay? Okay, so what's the first comparative static? Um, what, is, what does that suggest about the mechanics of the regression? So we have two identical data sets. The only difference is that the error variance is greater in one. What does that mean? Uh, that in this case, we're going to be less sure of our estimates. The variance of beta hat is greater. Okay? We're just going to have less confidence in our estimates. That makes sense, right? If we have very small error variances, we're going to be able to estimate that linear relationship very precisely. How about if our, we have the two, same data sets, but in this case, the x's on the left are very spread out. We have a lot of variation in the x's. And in the other case, the x's are all uh, smushed together into one little area. Well, in the case where they're all smushed together, remember in the limit, we can't even estimate our linear regression uh, coefficients, right? Remember the picture I showed you at the beginning where all of the observations on x were on a single um, point? We couldn't even estimate the linear regression coefficients there. Here we can estimate them, but uh, the variance is going to be pretty big. We're going to be less sure of our estimates in this case 
uh, because we don't have a lot of uh, variation of X to help us identify the effect we're interested in. Okay? A larger N means a smaller variance of beta hat. Well, I don't need to draw a picture of this. Uh, we'll just note that this follows from the fact that beta hat uh, are consistent estimators. Okay? And then finally, there uh, is this mechanical relationship between the two estimates. So if we have for uh, the mean of our x's is positive, then basically if we have, if we sort of uh, overestimate the, the um, intercept of the line, we're going to underestimate the slope. Or an overestimate of the intercept is associated with an underestimate of the slope. An underestimate of the uh, intercept is associated with an overestimate of the slope. Okay, so it's just this mechanical relationship. And then if the if x bar is negative, the me mechanical relationship shifts. Okay, or flips. Okay. Okay. So one step further, if we use the stronger assumption that the errors are iid normal, uh, zero sigma squared. Then we obtain, in addition, so we already have the mean and the variance and the covariance of these two estimates, but we also have that they, um, they have normal distributions if the errors have normal distributions. Okay? So if we're willing or if we, we feel like imposing that extra assumption of normality of errors, then what we get out of it is normality of our estimators. Okay? Okay, one loose end. Um, if the, note that the distributions of beta naught hat and beta one hat are functions of sigma squared. Um, that is the, the error variance. We often don't know the error variance. Why would we know the error variance? Uh, so we estimate it, okay? And we're gonna use a different estimator than, uh, than estimators we've seen before. So we're going to use an estimator uh, that's equal to 1 over n minus 2 times the sum of the uh, residual squared. Okay? And this estimator, it turns out, is unbiased for sigma squared in the linear model. That's why we use it. Uh, why the minus 2 in the denominator? Well, it's because we're estimating two parameters. Do you remember our unbiased estimator for the variance when we were just estimating the mean? was, uh, had an n minus 1 in the, the denominator. Well, here we need the n minus 2 because we're estimating two parameters, a beta, beta naught and a beta 1, and it turns out that that's what we need for sigma squared to be unbiased. Okay? Yep? Can you remind us why that is or why we both need So, I didn't do the proof. Um, and to be honest, I don't have, I don't feel like I have a, a useful intuition to tell you. I mean, I, you know, I'm happy to give you the proof. And the proof of this, you know, the proof of this isn't much more complicated than in the sort of univariate case. Um, but, yeah, it's just, that's, it just turns out that, that that's what you need to do to have an unbiased estimator of the variance. Do you have a useful intuition? I don't know. No? Okay. To estimate three things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't know why, but it works. Mm -hmm. It does. <laughs> okay. So now I, I want to ask you to think back to um, when we were doing univariate inference and we replaced an unknown variance with an estimate of the variance. So we had a sample mean and the sample mean had a normal distribution, but we didn't know the variance. The, sorry, the standardized sample, the, you know, standardized sample mean had a standard normal distribution, but we actually didn't know what the variance was, and we replaced an estimate for the variance. What happened? You guys remember? That's what happened. T distribution, right? Okay. Well, same thing's going to happen here. Um, we'll, we'll talk, I won't talk about sort of t-tests in the, the context of linear regression today. 
Um, I should be able to get to them next time. Um, but basically, just to give you a little bit of a preview, the same thing's going to happen here. We have, under the assumption of normal errors, we have that beta naught hat and beta one hat have normal distributions, but we don't know what their variance is. We're going to have to use an estimated variance instead, typically. And so that's where the sort of t-test in the, in the linear regression context comes from. Okay? So now we're sort of, we have most of the pieces, the model, the estimators, information about the distribution of the estimators. We could proceed with inference. But I'm going to put that off for a little while. And um, what we're going to do now is take a, you know, a quick detour into something called analysis of variance. And then I'm also going to talk about some sort of practical issues uh, in estimating uh, linear regressions before we get to inference. We'll do inference next time. OK. So we, we want some way. Uh, typically, to indicate how closely associated X and Y are, or how much of Y's variation is explained by X's variation. Okay? And what we do is we perform an analysis of variance um, that I'll do in just a second, and that's going to lead us to a measure of goodness of fit for our linear regression. And that's uh, you know, typically sort of a useful gauge of, of you know, sort of how the regression is doing in some sense. OK, so let's start by defining the sum of squared residuals. OK, so we've actually already seen the sum of squared residuals. That's what we are minimizing, choosing you know, beta naught hat and beta 1 hat to minimize. OK, so let's just define this quantity here as the sum of squared residuals. And here's a picture of it. So the picture can't indicate, I mean, each one of these, what we do is we, we calculate e each one of these, we square it, and we add them together. That's the sum of squared residuals. And this is, in some sense, a measure of goodness of fit, right? Um, but it's not a very useful measure of goodness of fit because it's not unit free, okay, which is inconvenient. So let's say we have a data set and both of the variables are measured in, um, you know, uh, pounds, British pounds, and then we uh, uh, translate uh, both of the variables to dollars. Um, then the sum of squared residuals will actually change, and that's not a very convenient feature for sort of a measure of fit to have. Okay, but if we divide the sum of squared residuals by uh, some other sum of squares, the total sum of squares, for instance then that gives us a unit-free measure because the units cancel. So what's the total sum of squares? Well, the total sum of squares is we don't even fit a regression line. We just take the, uh, the, the uh, sample mean of y and just uh, calculate all of the deviations from the sample mean and square those up. So graphically, what does that look like? So let's say this line is y bar. Okay. So what we've done is we've just taken all of the the deviations from y bar, squared them, and summed them up. That's the total sum of squares. OK, so that, um, so we've got the residual sum of squares, and we've got the total sum of squares. And note that that is going to be a unit-free measure of goodness of fit uh, that's always going to be between 0 and 1. Why is it always between 0 and 1? Yep? Most values are always. Right, so I guess the question is actually, why is uh, the SSR always less than SST? Because they're both positive? Yeah. yeah okay. They're both positive, yes. So you got half of it right. OK, yep. Is that still like the maximum error you have? Uh, no, well, no. I could, I, could draw, I could draw a line that gave me um, more error. But basically, the, the, you're, you're on the right track. The SSR is the least error you can have. Why is that? That's how we chose the regression line, to minimize that quantity. Okay? So any other line is going to have, it's going to give you higher sum of squared errors. Any, anything else you do is going to give a higher sum of squared errors than the SSR. Okay? And so that's what, yes, so you got half of it. They're both uh, non-negative by construction, and the fact that the regression line is the least squares line 
ensures that SSR is always less than or equal to SST. Okay. Okay. So that could be our goodness of fit measure. Actually, I guess we wanted a goodness of fit measure um, that had larger values when the fit was better or explained more. So instead, what we decided is uh, we'd use, we'd define our goodness of fit measure R squared to be equal to 1 minus SSR over SST. Okay? It's, a, it's an arbitrary decision, but that's, that's what it is. And it turns out that the total sum of squares can be decomposed into two terms, the residual sum of squares and something called the model sum of squares. Um, and so then R squared, it could also be written as just the model sum of squares over the total sum of squares. Okay. Here's the model sum of squares and here's a picture of it. Okay. It's just the fitted value, the sort of difference between the fitted value and the and y bar. Oh, that's just something about the decomposition. Okay. Okay, so we've got this thing called R squared. And in a bivariate regression, so in the, in the regressions we've seen so far that just have one explanatory variable, this R squared is actually equal to the sample correlation coefficient for x and y. So we've, we have, in fact, seen this measure before. Um, why do we feel like we have to define this new goodness of fit uh, measure for linear regression? Well, it is, in fact, a more general formulation and it's defined for linear models with more than one explanatory variable. So when we get to multiple regression, we can have the same, we can define the R squared exactly the same way as we just defined it, okay? Um, and in addition to using R squared as a basic measure of goodness of fit of our regression, we can also use it as the basis of a test of the hypothesis that uh, our slope is equal to zero, okay? And when we get to multiple regression, um, it, it's going to be a test of the hypothesis that beta 1, that, that sort of the slopes on all of our explanatory variables are equal to 0, okay? If we have k explanatory variables. And what is, uh, so what's, you know, what exactly is this test? Well, we create this test statistic, which is just equal to n minus 2, times r squared over 1 minus r squared. And it turns out that this thing, under the uh, under assumption that the errors are normally distributed, has an f distribution under the null. And uh, it's, it's um, going to be large. So we're going to reject the null if it's large. Okay. So why does that make sense? Is, is anyone willing to take a stab at sort of explaining the intuition behind this? No, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll take a stab at it then. So basically the idea is if our R squared is large, that means that the variation in X is explaining a lot of the variation in Y, okay? We have a, a, a high measure for our goodness of fit. And so this thing is going to be large, okay? This quantity is gonna be large. And so we want to reject the null that the, the um, coefficient on x, this beta 1, is equal to 0, okay? If the x does a good job of explaining, the variation in x does a good job of explaining the variation we're seeing in y, then beta 1 isn't equal to 0, okay? or, or, or with high prob probability, we can reject the hypothesis that beta 1 is equal to 0 in that case, okay? And so that then we want to, you know, when this is large, that's when we want to reject this hypothesis. Okay? Does that make sense? Somewhat? Okay. We'll see the F, we'll see the F test again. If it and doesn't. here represents uh, number of variables or observations? Sorry? And here represents number of variables? No, number of observations. observations. Number of observations. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Let's talk about a few practical issues. Um, then we'll introduce multiple regression, although I don't think we'll get to that this time. And then we'll return to inference after that, okay? 
Okay, so what does regression output look like and how do we interpret it? So uh, first let me show you some uh, regression output from Stata. So I know that you guys are using R and I'll show you some R output in a second. Um, but most of the uh, regression output I have sitting on my computer happens to be in Stata. And it's probably good for you to see the elements in sort of different uh, statistical packages and be able to sort of uh, figure out what all of these numbers mean. So here on the Stata output, we have a beta 1 hat is just uh, listed under this column that says coefficient. And then beta not hat is um, at the bottom. Stata always puts the, the sort of estimated constant, uh, beta not hat, at the bottom. Okay. Right after the estimated coefficients for, um, you know, sort of uh, beta 1 hat, or, you know, for beta 1 and, and beta not, we have uh, the standard errors listed. Okay. So those are the estimated uh, standard deviations of the distributions of those estimators. So I was the one who gave LHD3Rev its name. And that's, uh, that's just a variable. I mean, I could tell you what's in this regression. This is basically a regression taken from one of my papers where we were trying to explain uh, the, the, the uh, sort of ratio of ad detail advertising in pharmaceuticals uh, to sales, trying to explain that ratio uh, with um, sort of characteristics of the market, like revenue. Okay? So that's one of our measures of revenue. That's, so that's, that's a crazy name for a variable. Um, we called it something different in the paper, but you know, in our, you know, in my sort of crazy Stata code, that's what it ended up being. Uh, the underscore, underscore cons, that's uh, a name given by Stata. So that's basically just saying that's the estimator for the constant or the intercept in the regression. Okay. Um, so the standard errors are listed there. And then we also have, we'll get to the, I'll point out the t-test in a second. Um, but here are the results for the f-test that I uh, mentioned. So typically, oh, let me just say something. So typically, uh, statistical packages, when they give you the output for regression, give you a bunch of stuff for free. And one of the things they give you for free is the standard f-test I just mentioned. Okay? So they'll, they'll just run it for you for free, and they'll report the, the results. And here are the results. Um, let me take this question, and then I'll explain it. Yep. So when you're describing <coughs> What's the convention for how much of this you share? Like, what if? Ah, I'm so glad you asked, and I will talk about that next time. So, uh, I will have, um, I'll have examples of tables that I want your. Well, they're they're examples of tables from my papers, but they're also examples of tables that I want your, the tables in your empirical project to look like, and and it yeah, it will be clear next time. So, good question. Okay, so that, here are the results of the, the sort of standard F-test. And what this particular F-test says, remember we want to reject for large values of uh, the test statistic. We want to reject the null that beta 1 is equal to 0 if we get large values of that F-test. Okay? So they performed the F-test, and they also gave us the p-value. So Last time Esther defined what the p-value is, that's basically the probability that, I hope I don't screw up this, this uh, verbal definition, it's the probability that, it's, it's the point at which if you were doing a size p-test, you would reject the null, okay? So what size test do we usually do? We do 5% tests, we do 1% tests, things like that. Here, we have to do a test as large as an, a, basically an 18% test in order to reject the null. We're never going to do an 18% test, so we don't reject the null here. Okay? So basically, if you looked up you know, 1.9, which is the value of our F statistic uh, for this particular regression, if you looked up the critical values in an F table, you would 
you know, conclude that you don't want to reject the null under this case. And that's exactly what the, uh, the results here tell you. They say, uh, unless you're just, you're, you're doing, you know, you're choosing a ridiculously high alpha for your test, you don't want to reject the null. Okay? How about this one, though? For this one, we would reject the null um, for that beta 1 is equal to 0. If we were either doing, or sorry, if we were doing a 5% test, if we were doing a 1% test, we would not reject the null. So basically what this F test is telling us is that if we want to do, uh, you know, sort of, um, yeah, a 3, this is, this is the p-value. The p-value sort of tells us the boundary of the size of the test, uh, uh, you know, at which we would reject, okay? Is that clear? And here, uh, we also get this for free every time we run a regression. They perform a t-test for, um, you know, basically the hypothesis that that particular coefficient is equal to zero, okay? And we'll talk about, you know, sort of I'll make uh, more precise next time what exactly what these tests are. Um, but this is just a t-test for the, um, you know, for the, each coefficient being equal to zero. And in this case, we do not, uh, we don't reject the null for either one. I guess down here, uh, we reject the null for this one at, at 5%. Okay, so here's some R output, um, courtesy of Angela, who was up late last night running, my <laughs> running some regressions. So it looks a little different. It has most of the same elements in it. So here they put the intercept, they, they, instead of calling it the constant, they call it the intercept. And they put it first instead of second. This is the, uh, the, the variable uh, name that Angela came up with. Uh, so again, that's sort of, you know, your choice when you're programming. You sort of call your variables what you want. And uh, you also get, uh, you get the standard errors and you get the t-tests for free. Um, the f-test here, instead of being listed in the upper right corner like it is in the state of output, it's listed at the bottom, uh, but it's the same information. It basically gives you the value of the f-statistic and then tells you the p-value um, at which, or you know, sort of the size of the test at which you would reject the null. And here, this is a very small p-value. So any traditional test, you would reject the null that beta 1 is equal to 0 here. Okay? And then you can even, this is, um, well, let me just go back for a second and note that the r squared of this regression is a uh, 0.41, okay? And if you're wondering what a 0.41 r-squared might look like in a scatter plot, so this is a scatter plot of the variables and uh, the fitted regression line through them, okay? And if you're curious about the particular variables, this is just, these are variables from the general social survey about attitudes on abortion and how they have sort of been uh, evolving over the past couple of decades in the U.S. Okay, questions? Okay, so how do we interpret these, uh, these parameter estimates? And in particular, how do we interpret uh, the estimated coefficient on our x variable, this sort of beta 1 hat? Well, beta 1 hat is the estimated effect of y of a one unit increase in x, okay? So the precise nuances of the interpretation are going to depend a little bit on whether we think that we've estimated a causal relationship or whether we think we've estimated something else, okay? So the language you might use could be a little bit different, but this is the basic idea. This is how we interpret uh, what uh, beta 1 hat means. Okay, so let me show you. These are some data um, that I downloaded from, let's see, uh, the ESPN website. Uh, this is, I did this several years ago. So this is data involving the 2005 Major League Baseball season. And what I did is I downloaded um, 
the number of wins of each team and the attendance, the, the complete uh, uh, season-long attendance uh, for each team and wanted to see if there was some uh, relationship between attendance and number of wins. Okay, so what did I do? I regressed attendance, that's the, my dependent variable, my Y variable, on the number of wins that each team had. And we see here, based on this regression, that one additional win is associated, oh, and I should say the attendance was in thousands. That was the unit I used. So one additional win is associated with an additional 31,000 fans in attendance over the course of the season. Okay? So we might want to exercise a little caution to think that this is a causal relationship. We'll sort of get to that more later in the semester, but at least uh, sort of this regression uh, suggests that an additional win is associated with 31,000 fans in attendance. And it, an additional 31,000 fans in attendance. Okay? Okay, uh, another practical issue. What if X only takes on two values, zero and one? Uh, well, we have a special name for that type of variable. We call it a dummy variable, or sometimes we call it an indi indicator variable. And there's no problem at all in that. There's nothing in our assumptions that have, that rule this out. Okay, so there's, you know, that, that uh, you know, that is not a problem for estimating a, a, a linear regression, and in fact, dummy variables can be quite useful, okay? The pictures will look a little different. I'll show you a, a picture in a second, okay? Here's what I mean. If we only, if our x variable only takes on values 0 and 1, uh, then, you know, we sort of don't have this nice cloud of data. We just have these two, you know, but nothing wrong with that, right? Okay, and then we estimate, then sort of beta not hat is interpreted as the, the uh, sort of mean of the group of observations that have the dummy variable equaling zero, and beta one hat is the, uh, the, the sort of um, increment in the mean, or the you know, sort of effect of having the dummy variable equal one. Okay, so, Dummy variables serve a number of important roles in linear models, and we've actually seen one already, uh, uh, randomized controlled trials. So when Esther was talking about having sort of two groups, a treatment and a control group, we could just simply have done the whole analysis in the linear regression framework, uh, assigning a zero to one of the groups and a one to the other group, okay? So suppose we have some treatment in whose effect we're interested. We randomly assign the treatment to half of the observations, leave the other half untreated. We assign the treated observations x equals 1 and the untreated x equals 0. Okay? And then if we estimate the regression above, beta 1 hat will be the estimated effect of the treatment. And by the way, X need not be randomly assigned half zeros and half ones or anything like that to be a dummy variable. So we, can't, we do use dummy variables or can use dummy variables if we do have this sort of random assignment um, variable, but we can use it for lots of other things too. Any characteristic of the observations that exists on some but not all observations can be represented uh, with a dummy variable. Okay? So there's nothing about a dummy variable we're, we're assuming is randomly assigned or anything like that. Okay, and we'll see lots of other uses of dummy variables when we get to multiple regression because we can use them to sort of um, um, multiply, we can use them to interact with uh, other explanatory variables and shift slopes around and, and uh, you know, trace out nonlinear relationships. We can do all kinds of tricky things with dummy variables um, and we'll see that later. Okay. Um, another uh, sort of practical issue that we'll sort of deal with in more detail uh, in um, multiple regression. You might be thinking, well, fine, the linear model seems pretty useful. We can uh, use it for all kinds of stuff, but isn't it really restrictive? I mean, maybe the relationship between these variables, there is a relationship, but it's just not linear. And so we're sort of imposing linearity on here. And that seems like something we wouldn't often want to do. Well, there are a couple things I can say about this. One is that 
the linear model is actually super flexible. Okay? So for instance, we can, um, we can take nonlinear functions of both of the variables, x variable and y variable, and uh, sort of analyze those, uh, the sort of relationships between those nonlinear functions of x and y within a linear framework. Um, we can also uh, create uh, interaction variables, which is sort of the product of two variables, and that allows for you know, sort of uh, other types of uh, nonlinearity. And we can do all of this, and like I said, we can use dummy variables to sort of allow for nonlinear, um, you know, allow for sort of nonlinear shapes uh, by sort of um, you know, tricky multiplication. We'll show you examples of that. But the point I want to make now is just that this is actually, it seems like it might be a restrictive framework. It's actually a super flexible framework. Um, and we'll see all kinds of examples about how flexible the linear framework actually is. One additional comment I want to make about this is that we can do um, the non-parametric version of a linear regression that Esther talked about uh, last time, a kernel regression. And, uh, Researchers do um, perform, they do estimate kernel regressions, and um, they're useful in a lot of situations, but there are serious trade-offs, and there are very good reasons why the linear regression is the workhorse that it is. Uh, and the trade-offs mostly uh, come in the form of efficiency. A linear regression is going to be a much, much more efficient way to estimate a relationship than um, than a kernel regression. So the kernel regression is uh, sort of infinitely flexible in some sense, but you pay for it because it's not an, a, a, an efficient estimator at all, really. OK. So questions about those sort of practical issues concerning linear, linear regression. OK. So let me just get started. I have a few minutes now. And we'll get started on uh, a generalization of the linear model, the sort of multivariate um, linear model, OK? And uh, this, is, um, this is what it looks like. So why might we be interested in sort of this more general linear model? I mean, maybe the answer is kind of obvious. but you know, I could sort of talk about a lot of, um, you know, we could talk about a lot of uh, examples where, you know, we're, in, we're primarily interested in the relationship between one particular x variable and our dependent or y variable. But there are other factors that might come into play that we need to account for in our analysis. So that's one very good reason. To, to consider uh, sort of this multivariate um, linear model as opposed to just the bivariate linear model. It could also be that um, we, uh, you know, we actually have many variables. We, we don't have any a priori notion about what x variables might be important uh, predictors of y. So think back to the example of a firm trying to decide who to serve ads on um, the, that Moby Dick t-shirt to. Well, they might not have any sort of a priori reason to think, well, it's people who read XKCD who might buy this t-shirt. And what they would like to do is get sort of the web browsing behavior of lots and lots of people and see all kinds of uh, websites that they visit figure out which ones actually buy this t-shirt, and then use the results of that um, analysis to figure out who to serve ads to in the future. Okay? So that's another reason why we want to consider models that have lots of, uh, potentially lots of regressors in them, not just one. Okay? So as I said before, the sort of notation we were using for the bivariate regression was just, it was just sort of not up to the task. It was kind of clunky. It was a little awkward. And it turns out that uh, we can sort of all of the things that I um, 
can you know, say about linear regression can be said much more elegantly using matrix notation. Okay? So what we're going to do, I, by the way, maybe I should take a show of hands. How many people are familiar with some basic matrix notation and linear algebra facts? Okay, so there might be a couple who aren't, but it seems like the vast majority of the class is. So I have put up on the website, also under resources, a, a separate handout, and I forget what it's called. Maybe it's called Matrix Notation, et cetera, or something like that. And basically, it goes through in greater detail than I'm going to do in lecture. Um, you know, it, it gives you both a primer for you know, uh, matrix notation and reminds you sort of definitions, uh, you know, matrix algebra, you know, linear algebra kind of definitions, reminds you of those, but then also sort of goes through uh, the, the um, uh, linear regression stuff in more detail than I'm going to do in lecture. So you can look at those notes if you want. Okay, so this is a job for matrix notation. We don't have too much time, but I'll just get started here. Let's replace this whole parade of x's with a vector, a row vector, okay? And let's um, say, let's define a new x that's identically equal to 1, and that's called x sub 0, 1, okay? And the reason we do this is because sort of implicitly in the bivariate regression, we had beta naught times 1. We never had the 1 there. But we, you know, sort of implicitly there was a 1 multiplying beta naught, and then we had beta 1 times x sub i. Well, here we want to explicitly have the, the, the 1 in that first spot so we can do everything in matrix notation, okay? And so um, let's define, let's replace this whole, whole parade of x's with a row vector. And so for each observation, we have a vector of different measures, x naught up through x sub k for each observation. Okay? And then let's also replace uh, uh, all of the betas that multiply all of these regressors by a vector, in this case a column vector, um, a k, by, k plus 1 by 1 column vector of um, uh, parameters beta. Okay? Okay, and then that lets us uh, use a much more condensed notation for our um, multivariate linear model. And it's just y sub i equals x sub i beta plus epsilon sub i. Okay, so this is still, this is the model for, for each individual observation. And so we can go even further, and we can basically put all the observations into um, matrices or vectors and sort of compress our notation even further, okay? So now let's let y, uh, the, the entire um, set of observations on the, our outcome variable across our different observations, let's put that into a n by one column vector. And then let's put our errors also into an n by one column vector. And then let's take each one of these row vectors that I defined on the previous slide. So remember, for each observation, we had a row vector that was the measures of all of the x's for each observation. Let's stack those up and put those into uh, an n by k plus 1 matrix. Okay? So remember, this column here is identically equal to 1. And then these the second column on are all measures of our explanatory variables x1 through xk. Yes? Yes, it is supposed to be x. <laughs> so yes, the, 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 the i subscript snuck in there, and I apologize for it. Yes? So each row is x sub i. Yes. So each row vector we'll call x sub i. This entire matrix we'll call it x. So you're absolutely right. Okay? Is everyone on board with this structure? Okay? So one more slide and then we'll call it a day.
then when, when we have defined everything and sort of created that structure, uh, we now can write the multiple, multivariate linear regression model or linear model as y equals x beta plus epsilon uh, with all of those dimensions up there. Okay? So we'll start here next time and um, see you guys in a couple of days. <laughs>